So I wondered who would be stupid enough to come to a conference right now. Um, I didn't have a choice. So, so what I want to talk about today is um, to kind of pick up on some of the themes that were mentioned at the beginning. There's a lot of pessimism about the space. Um, and there's been this promise. People like me, for quite a while now, have been talking about Web3. We've been promising you Web3. Um, but where the hell is it? And more to the point, what is it? So, you know, what, what people have been saying over the last 10 years or so since this trigger of innovation of Bitcoin was that, like every other major cycle in computing, um, an open source technology comes along and it flattens the previous paradigm. Um, and that paradigm being Web 2, dominated by platform monopolies, um, or to be more specific, this kind of combination of uh, cloud platforms. Cloud giving the distributed compute power to make these platforms possible uh, and, and global. Um, but we were promised that this new paradigm would come along and it would flatten that, it would unbundle it, and it would decentralize the web or re-decentralize the web. Um, and it would have social consequences. It would be socially different, economically different, not just technically um, different. But the reality is the world today looks pretty much the same as it did before we started talking about blockchain. If anything, it looks worse. And so, you know, there was this promise of radical decentralization um, and all these qualities that would be brought about by Web3 or the decentralized web or the web of trust. And at the heart of that, it was this idea that we would flip the web. And so we would move power to the individual, the user, rather than the platform. They would get control of their data. They would then give permission to platforms about what they could and couldn't do um, with their data. But actually, all we've really had over the last 10 years is an experiment in what is money. We've been lectured by teenagers in bedrooms about economics. We've been told that we're seeing innovations in governance like we don't have a millennia of centralization and decentralization in political science. Um, again, you know, it doesn't feel very new and different. Um, and now we're told that DeFi is the next thing. DeFi is the thing that's going to make all this happen. It's going to bring it to life. Um, and we're told that DeFi is all about financial inclusion. But actually, if you want to be skeptical, um, you could say the only thing that people have been included in is losing a lot of money, this kind of rampant speculation. Um, and we're just left with a load of barren protocols that nobody's really using other than the same old early adopters on the edge or fringe of society, be that drug dealers, gamblers, children gaming in bedrooms, um, or worse, day traders. Um, and again, you know, this doesn't really feel like we're bringing on um, the masses. But actually, if you want to think about, in a positive slant, what, what we've managed to achieve in the last 10 years, we've managed to build a proto-capital market bottom-up native to the internet. Um, and that's no easy feat. And I'm sure um, many of us didn't think that that would happen when we first saw Bitcoin. We might think it may stay limited. Um, and now we're seeing this Cambrian explosion of innovation happening. Um, and it was reported in January of this year that uh, the amount of USD locked up in DeFi went up by 40, 50%. We uh, came close to about a billion dollars. It's probably gone down now. But the reality is that, as great as that might seem, the majority of value is still locked in fairly centralized platforms, uh, Binance or Coinbase. Um, and the reason for that is because most people, the average uh, person, even in these early adopter segments, want the assurances that they can um, get their money back. And if we want to bring on... Um, users and adopters outside of this kind of early adopter segment, they will want regulatory assurances, perhaps insurances, that they're going to get their money and it's going to be protected. So we're also seeing that a lot of projects that start out in DeFi and are successful go on to try to acquire licenses to basically join the system that uh, they were supposed to displace. 
But maybe that's the point. So maybe the point of all of this is we have this permissionless sandbox where experiments can be carried out, such as what is money. Um, and this gives us this extra territor territoriality um, to carry out innovation in social constructs. Um, and ultimately, the Web3 that we want to see happen will be negotiated in these environments with regulators. Now, we have, at the same time, had billions of dollars go into um, effectively hardening these networks, these protocols that are going to enable this new proto-capital market. And with every day, despite all the drama that goes on around these protocols, every day that that protocol still exists and people still have money on it, albeit internet money, the more we trust it. And in this context, time is literally money. At the same time, um, what we've seen in DeFi, I believe, is a prelude to other forms of economic experiments and social contracts beyond money that will be carried out. So if we look at the PKI infrastructure that we've had to take custody of internet money, I believe then that can then be extended to other forms of new digital value. Um, and with this, we now have these new innovations. So we have verifiable state and we have verifiable logic. And okay, crypto and this whole space is still fairly opaque. That's been perverted by the removal of equity um, when most people raise money through ICOs. But even with something like Binance, which you could say is very centralized, we can still verify certain things about Binance that happens on the network. Um, and so these are the early beginnings in experimentation of being able to verify things about social contracts that we can make that live entirely on the internet. Uh, but the big, the big kind of question here is when you speak to be an, a naysayer about this, I say, okay, well, but again, the world still looks very similar. So the adage that came from Andreessen, which was software's eating the world, well, software's still eating the world. In fact, when we say software, we don't mean software, we mean platforms. Platforms are still eating the world and they're still as entrenched as they ever were and platforms have become monopolies, have become data monopolies, have become AI monopolies, and monopolies monopolize. So it's no surprise that Facebook and Google um, and all these incredibly dominant forces um, are not going to give up control likely. And the reality is um, regulators aren't going to break them up either, not even here in Europe. So it's certainly not going to happen in the US. So the question is, do we still have to just trust that Google does no evil. Well, they've already scrapped that as a commitment to us. Um, so we know that we can't trust Google to do no evil. So I really like this, this great marketing tactic by Blockstack, which was can't do evil. And again, if we go back to this verification of trust, verification of state, verification of logic, um, increasingly, we can be sure that there might be this market-driven decentralization. It is not going to come from regulators. We know that. Um, and if we think about what the social contract of using the web is today, um, albeit implicit, is that you pay for a free web with your data. The problem is those terms of service with the platforms and the platform administrators, um, firstly, nobody can really understand them. And even if you could, you couldn't really interrogate whether they've been breached or broken or not. Um, so in effect, that plat platform administrator can do what the hell they want. Um, and I think if we expect these platforms to all of a sudden embrace a technology that means we could verify these social contracts and these commitments, um, I think we're living in cloud cuckoo land. It's just not going to happen. And at the moment, it's optional. That's the problem. So it's optional for any participant in blockchain or otherwise, to, um, to, to play the game of being verifiable. So what's next? If we know we have this proto-jurisdiction, this proto-capital market, um, this permissionless sandbox to innovate, we know we've got the innovations, the fledgling innovation of verifiable state and verifiable logic, um, then we know we have this kind of toolkit, but we just can't manage to bring it to market 
in order that it becomes undeniable, irresistible, the momentum behind it, the gravity behind it. So I believe the thing that's been missing from Web3, which is critical to it becoming not a choice, is what I'm starting to call sovereign technologies. So these are technologies that fundamentally preserve, restore, and extend the sovereignty of the user. So it is not optional, it is non-optional. This will make it universal, and it will begin to make trust a moat. Projects that do not embrace this will not be able to keep their users. Projects that do, and, and are consistent in doing so, will be able to retain users. Um, and this will extend pretty much anywhere where Web2 has replaced a social contract with a, with a platform. Um, and as I said, this can start to extend into other areas of our world. What are the social contracts are? There could be law. It could even move all the way to what is state, these questions that we ask ourselves whilst we're experimenting. So what do I mean by sovereign technology? Well, the first very simple technology that's taken decades to create and has been accelerated by instance of blockchain is self-sovereign identity and an innovation called a DID, a decentralized identifier that is rapidly being adopted not just by crazies in the crypto world, um, but by IBM and Microsoft as a standard for identity. Um, and so what does that mean? What it means if you speak to anybody in the identity space is they'll say there's no such thing as identity. It doesn't exist. There are things you can verify about yourself with a degree of probability. Um, you can have others attest for that. And effectively, it is verification and attestation of credentials. And it sounds really simple and it sounds really boring, but it is the cornerstone that will enable us to build a Web3 because all of a sudden, identity and anything I associate with my identity um, becomes portable. I can revoke permission and I can, I, I can give permission and if the terms of that permission are broken, it will automatically break. And so once you begin to do that, you can then extend all of these innovations about securing identity with securing that, um, securing data, associated data, and the terms through which you're going to share that data. And if we think about the current social construct of the web um, and the commitment, it's about I pay for things with my data, um, whether I like it or not. Um, here you can begin to permission that data, you can rent that data, you can make it available without handing it over, so you can make it available to computation, multi-party computation. Um, you can end up with data sovereignties, pools of data we can choose to pool for certain purposes, for certain outcomes. This effectively will allow for the commodification of data. Currently, if you think about the data economy as it stands, and it's called the most valuable asset on the planet, yet nobody really knows how to price it. We price it because Google tells us how it's priced, or Facebook tells us how it's priced, and we trust them even though we know that their share price is correlated exactly to how they say it's priced. Um, there's no other way of knowing because it's siloed. It's either siloed within these platforms or it's siloed in this long tail at the edge. All of a sudden, with data and data portability and data ownership and these new data sovereignties, we can unleash the long tail of data, um, and it can allow us to then create a new data economy um, where we have this sovereign technologies, which will increase the production, the distribution and consumption of data, and this is something that we've been investing in at Outlier for the last three and a half years, is this, this stack that enables a new data economy. Um, and ultimately, it will then allow us to have an abundance of data to feed into um, machine learning and to do it the edge of computation which will dramatically improve autonomous systems. So it seems really simple the innovation of a did and, and sovereign tech but it is going to um, release a Cambrian explosion of innovation within machine learning. If you ask me what is the main the main power of blockchain it is is largely around data. Um, and so where previously we paid for things with data um, when we can start to extend the ownership and permissioning of digital value, we can start to unlock other forms of intangibles. And that could be storage, it could be compute, it could be bandwidth. So I could pay for web services not just with data, it might be, it might be renting data, but it could also be with lots of other things that I don't necessarily put a price on. 
So what is the opportunity space? This is what interests me the most as an investor. We have an accelerator focused on pre-seed, seed, stage startups. Um, and so we're always asking ourselves, what are the things that we should be investing in now? Because timing is everything when you're investing in early stage startups. There's no point investing in something um, that's too early. Well, actually, all the things that I was just complaining about at the beginning map perfectly alongside the diffusion S-curve. So almost to the date, 10 years in, we've had this innovation and the market trying to guess and price that innovation. We've had the speculative flurry. Uh, and now we're moving into a period of synergy. So finding synergies around innovations like DIDs and SSI, um, creating stacks, consolidating, bundling technologies into stacks. Um, and then that consolidation into business models. So we won't get away from this decentralization and um, uh, uh, recentralization of technologies. That's inherent to the internet. But what we can do is change the DNA about how that bundling happens. And if the DNA of that is secured by sovereign technology, the next paradigm can and will be different. And so the areas that we're investing in at Outlier are we believe there are enough protocols now and they have stood the test of time where we can begin to trust them with more economic work. But increasingly, we're looking at solving the verification problem, authentication and verification. We did that with investment in Sovereign and Evanim. Um, and now increasingly middleware, so making all of these protocols usable, because 99% of developers on GitHub are not doing anything remotely related to blockchain. So if we're talking about adoption, it's with developers first. And then eventually taking a pragmatic approach to applying these technologies to real world business use cases. And that's something I call Web 2.5. Before we get to Web 3, we have to first start with Web 2.5 and we have to be pragmatic, not dogmatic about that. And so as the great saying goes, like debt and divorce and all the, all the forms of disruption that we might face in our life, it first gradually and then suddenly. And I believe self-sovereign identity and sovereign technology will be the thing this year that will begin to catalyze Web3. And all of a sudden, when we can do permissioning, we can give permission not just to an agent in a dumb sense, a platform like Facebook, um, but we can give permission to agents that carry out work on our behalf in an autonomous way, but in a verifiable way. And so our investment in Fetch, which is a UK-based project allowing for autonomous economic agents, can be possible because we can trust those agents to serve us and not a platform like Alexa serves Amazon. So that's my rant over. I hope it made sense. Um, as was mentioned at the beginning uh, of the talk, we, we've just released a report yesterday on looking at the London blockchain ecosystem. It really is very unique. It really is world leading. And I think historically, if we're talking about innovations and in things like, you know, what is a corporation? What is law? What is capital markets? What is money? We have quite a bit of form in that with our professional services, our capital market industry. So I believe we're very well placed to continue to be a global leader. Um, I'm glad you all made it here and hopefully I'll see you next year. No guarantees on that.